this past week, as Julie had mentioned, I had the privilege of going with my wife and several other friends uh, to hear Pastor Tim Oldfield speak at a Church of God assembly in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, he gave a, just a powerful, powerful word. And I want to share a little bit of what he shared uh, that Wednesday with us because um, it's just God is always connecting dots. And as we were talking in our class today, the whole conference was about the conversation of go. The church is called to go and make disciples of all nations. And um, we've been talking about the fact that God is stirring things here, and God is telling us as well to begin to go. And um, as, he was, as he was talking, though, he talked a lot about the fact that um, it is important to be able to go, but it's also very, very, very important to recognize that, that when we go, that when we go, it's really not us going, it's God going before us. Amen? And if we go underneath our own flesh, we'll always find calamity or failure somewhere along the way. And so his conversation was, as a seasoned pastor, to talk about being able to rest in God as you go, the ability to be able to rest in the presence of God as you go, so that you yourself do, do not get worn out. And it is, the, it is the conversation that I think God wants us to have today about how do we find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ in our going, um, as we're doing what God were to call us to do and call us to accomplish for his kingdom and glory. So let's, if you don't mind, let's read a passage of scripture. We're going to read several today, but we're going to start with Psalm 127, verse 1, and then we're going to go in for a little bit of word of prayer, if you don't mind. One of my favorite passages, and as a pastor, it's one passage that I go back to all the time to, to be able to readjust or calibrate. And what I mean by that, do you know how it is that if you're heading down a certain road, because God's giving you direction and you know that's how you're supposed to go, but sometimes in the busyness of your doing, do you find that, that you start going a little bit different direction, but you don't mean to? You start putting things on you that you're not supposed to put on you. God has packed you in such a certain way and has called you to go do something, and we start doing that. But I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to pick up false responsibilities and false obligations. And before I get to where I'm called to go, I find myself almost exhausted. I'm wore out. My body wasn't meant to carry 600 pounds of, of luggage. It wasn't meant to do that. God had told me to just simply take these things, and those things being God told me to take the Word of God, God told me to be led by the Spirit of God, so always follow the Spirit of God. God told me to take my family with me and those around me with me, but, but that was really about it. God didn't tell me to take any other false responsibilities with me. God didn't tell me to take the responsibility of making things work out with me. God didn't say, Ben, it's up to you to make sure it all works out, and if it fails, it's on you. God didn't say that to me, and he didn't say it to you either, amen? But it's important that in our going that we recognize that, that sometimes we pick up excess baggage. We pick up things along the road that, that really will wear us down if we're not careful. And so this passage of Psalm 127 verse 1 puts everything in perspective to me as a pastor and as a father and as a child of God. When I begin to feel overwhelmed in my life, and I begin to feel like, God, I'm either I'm just not doing enough or, Lord, I'm not hearing enough from you. Why isn't this seem to be working? The Lord reminds me of this passage. So if you would join me, Psalm 127, verse 1. A song of decrees from Solomon. It says this, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walketh but in vain. I love, I love this passage, and I don't want to stay here too long, but I think it's important that we do, we do talk a little bit about this section. He says, Except the Lord build the house. So how many of you know that God's building something? Amen? How many of you know that God's always building something? God is either in the process of tearing down in order to remodel, but his heart is to always rebuild and put things back together in such a way that, that obviously brings him glory. And inside the body of Christ, inside of you and I, God is always building something. And sometimes he's removing a brick here and a brick here that's cracked, but he's always building it back up, um, that he would have a glorious house to dwell in. And so when God is building us, he's building us up for his presence to dwell inside of us. Amen? Amen? And it changes a little bit how you think about yourself. Because see, if God is building my house, he's building it so that he would have a place to dwell. Which means that he deems that I am worthy for his glory to, to dwell with inside of me. And so therefore I must be a house that is, that is a house that is worthy of the presence of God. And that is only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's only because of his grace that, that we can acknowledge that we are a house where the Spirit of God dwells because 
he has called us worthy to dwell inside of us. Amen? Amen. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that I'm not in charge of building my house. God, you're going to build my house. I'm just in charge of being obedient when you tell me to be obedient. But, Father, ultimately, you are in control of the success of the way it looks, of how it's going to come out, of, of, God, what you're doing in my life. Amen? And so, other passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6-7 through 7 says this, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So if I am a house of God, am I, if I am a place where the God and the Spirit of God dwells, is it me that, that, that makes forth the manifestation of what God wants to do around me? Is it, is it, is it me that, that is, it, is it just I that does it, or is it that God is the one that blesses it and prospers it? It's God. It's, it's God. As I raise my children, as I teach my children, Lisa and I try to have devotions with our children. We're getting so busy. We, have together, we come together on Thursday evenings, and we share the word of God, and we talk about what God's doing in everybody's life. And, and Lisa and I try to share every day we have devotions. And what we're doing is this. As a father, as a husband of the household, my job is to be able to allow my family and teach them how to come into the word of God, to be able to read the word of God and grow in the word of God, to talk about it to allow the Word of God to be active and living within my family. My job as a husband is to love my wife and not cheat on my wife. My job is to, to be a man of prayer, a man that, that loves the Word of God, that teaches the Word of God, that I get up and I work, I do the things that God has called me to do. But when it comes to the increase of my household, ultimately that belongs in the responsibility of God. Amen? And this is an important principle because if we don't, if we don't start with this, if we, now again, I know that we're all farmers in this community, and so there's a sense of work ethic. And I'm not talking about the opposite of work ethic. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the re end result of the work ethic has got to be the, that God moved in that situation, and he breathed in his timing, and he blessed it, and he brought glory to it. I could never do that. I could never do the supernatural, nor could you do the supernatural. I could never bring life into the world. Only God can bring life into the world. But we have to be, obviously, we have to be good stewards of the things around us, but ultimately, it is God that ignites life, amen? It is God that does the miraculous. Do I do the miraculous when I pray over you to be healed? Is that the power of Ben Geyser? Never, that's heresy. It's only the power of God that brings healing. If I speak a word of prophecy or knowledge over you, is that my prophetic things or, or my knowledge? By no means, it's always God that is doing those things and changing those lives and making the increase. So therefore, in the vessel of man, as the word of God says, I would to never brag about what I have done in the kingdom. It would, be, it would be false pride. It would be stupidity. Only God can do these things and make these changes in our life. Amen? Amen. And so we have to be so careful, as the word of God talks to us about this, that we have to be so careful of the vanity of I, or the vanity of, of what we can do for the kingdom of God to make it work. We don't make anything work. God makes it all work because it's his kingdom. He's the oil, he's the lubricant, he's the fire, he's the spark, and by all means, praise God, he's the fuel, amen? amen. He's the only thing that ignites the engine to be able to run. He's the only transmission we need to put it in drive, to take us where we're called to go. Yeah. So we as a body of Christ have to be so careful in these end times and in the mess that we find ourselves in that we don't try to manage it or make things just simply work. See, there is power and authority in the Christian's life, but I promise you it's not in these two hands. It's within the heart of the Father that comes through us as we pray in the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that as the world is falling apart, if we do, 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 we will eventually fall apart. See, the body was too frail. The body was only made to carry the glory of God. The body was never made to be the glory of God, this physical body I'm talking about. And so you and I have to just be so careful in the midst of our doing, in the midst of our growing, that, that we don't start stepping into false responsibilities or places that, that we think we have to do. And I think the Lord of God is saying to us that there is power in the places of rest. There's power in that, in that secret place, that quiet place with God, where we live and we dwell and we get built up so that God can begin to move and speak inside of us. But, but I believe the Lord is also saying to us that that place of the secret place be careful that it does not lose its sacredness inside the house of God and inside the children of God. 
There needs to be a, a special kept place for the, for the hiding place of God. And I believe the Lord is saying that he is concerned that my people don't visit me enough in the hiding place. They don't visit me enough in the high places of me because they are so busy doing that they're being pulled upon by the world to, to make this happen and to make this amount of money and to, to make my home look like this and to travel and do all these other things. And the Lord is being able to say to us that people spend more time in the high places of me and I will bless and I will glorify and I will lead you into things that you've never known before. I believe the church is ready for a battle. I really do. I believe that we are called to, to fight the battle that is in front of us. But, but if we fight it with yesterday's armor, if we fight it with yesterday's sleep, if we fight it with yesterday's food, and yet we do not sleep and feed today for the new battle, then we will be of no worth in the midst of the fight. And so God is saying to us that only those things can come in the sweet hiding place of him. That when we get alone with God and find a place to be able to dwell with God, it's where we are endued with power to be able to go forth and do what God has called us to do. But the secret hiding place in God, as I was reading some of these passages of Scripture, we're going to read in Psalm chapter 62 in a little bit, I was reading about the, high, the, the secret place of God, and the Lord said, the secret place of God is the high places of my heaven. The secret places of God is the high places of worship. It is the high places where I bring you out and put you upon a rock and allow you to be in a safe place, a place with firm foundation, where you do not need to fear the tempest by day or the fire by night that may come at your doorstep. It's a place where you are hemmed in and kept in in secret because this, the enemy cannot find you. The secret places of God is where the church needs to hide in order to build itself back up to come out and start swinging for the glory of God. And in this time, in this day and age, it is not just our job to occasionally visit this place. It is that we as a church frequent this place that every time we come together as the house of God, that we strive to go to the secret place of God, that we would be built up and be reunited and refired for the glory of God. And then, hallelujah, it's our job to be able to show the next generation, how do you get to the secret places of God? Let me take you with you and show you how I got there and show you what it's like in the presence of God where there is stillness and there is peace and there is quietness and you know you've just transferred to a different kingdom and the things that tormented you in the past don't torment you now. And church, it is, it is a desire, I think, in these end times for God to teach us how to, how to wield a sword with less effort but more power and more authority. And I believe that this becomes more real in the secret place, in the quiet place, where that nothing else can speak into you. It's just simply the Holy Spirit connecting you and making the Word of God a part of you. <coughs> I'm still fighting the cold, which is almost gone, by the way. Praise God, and thank you for your prayers. I felt a little tickle there. Amen. I don't know about you, though, but it is my desire. The Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit. Amen. You know, and as I, as I pray about that issue of the sword of the Spirit and this thing about the secret place of God and how the Word of God needs to become more and more a part of me, you know, it is one thing to be able to, if you ever watched a warrior that is ready for battle, he'll put on his armor and he'll go over and pick up his sword in preparation for battle. As I was reading about the hiding place and the secret place of God, and I was reading about the Word of God being the sword of the Spirit, I, I, God gave me a vision of the fact that as I spend more time in the Word of God, in the hiding place, see, see from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, is the hiding places of God. This, I hide myself in his word. And God begins to do miraculous things in the hiding places. And as I read the word of God, as I get to know the word of God so much, that this sword that I would pick up on a regular basis, all of a sudden spiritually becomes a manifestation or extension of my natural arm, where there's no longer a need to go and pick it up. It's just already attached to me. I wield it because of the fact that every place I go, it's with me. It's a part of me now because this has become so ingrained inside of me. I have an answer for every rebuke that comes my direction. I have an answer for every attack that comes at me because it's a natural thing because this is inside of me now. And so this sword naturally wields itself and it does it with such accuracy and interesting that I don't even have to hurt the body of Christ or those around me, but I can just simply attack the enemy that's coming against me. And see, that's only found in the secret place. That's only found when we begin to dive into the word of God. Because see, the heart of God is this. God is a God of warfare, but he's also a God of love and of peace. And if I rightly wield the sword of God, I can protect the saints and still kill the enemy. 
But if I'm not in the Word of God, I may wrongly wield the sword because I'm new. And that's, that's part of growing. That's being young. We may do things that we don't always understand. And we may make mistakes. But, but see, where the mistakes get dealt with is the hiding places of God. When I get alone with God and I get inside the Word of God, I begin to pray, <coughs> Lord God, show me what you see in me. And God begins to reveal and God begins to download and God begins to remove and God begins to replace. But it happens in the secret place between Genesis and Revelations. Hallelujah. And it's, there's so much life there. How many of you know the, the most safest place to be is in the middle of the Word of God? Amen? When I'm in the middle of the Word of God, I'm in the safest possible place. There's nothing that can really harm me. I'm sitting inside of truth. I'm sitting in something that was written from the kingdom of heaven that, that gives us truth and knowledge today. And so all I'm doing is breathing the Word of God into my situations. I'm breathing truth over those that are suffering. I'm breathing, I'm breathing God's direction over this evil spirit that seems to be taking over our land to be able to kill our police officers and challenge authority. I'm breathing and breathing life over the fact of those that are coming against women to torture them and abuse them in some possible way. Lord, in Jesus' name, the word of God is alive and active. And so as I'm alive and active in the secret place, this becomes alive and active in my prayer life. Amen? And so I can just simply pray alive and active. Why? Because I've been in the secret place with God. Now, let's just be honest. We can starve ourselves of the secret place, and sometimes we're so busy that we haven't visited as frequently as we need to. But the glory of God is that every day is a Genesis day, isn't it? So when I come into the kingdom of God, when I come into the secret place of God, what do I start with? I start with new beginnings. Hallelujah. And so when I come into the secret place and I begin to dwell upon the scriptures, God reminds me, baby, today's a new day. What you did yesterday, I've forgotten about, and I'm going to do something new today. Today's a new day of beginnings and promise. Today's a brand new day of life. And so if you got up today a little bit discouraged, I ask you to visit Genesis with me. For God said, and he created it, and it was good. Today's a new beginning of it is good in your life today. But I only find that because I get into the secret place and I start with Genesis. So today I believe God is saying that when we get into our secret places, when we're challenged with things, I believe the Lord begins to remind us of the goodness of what he's promised us. I believe the Lord speaks to us about the dominion that he's given us as well. God has taken the keys of death and hell from Satan, and he has complete sovereign and dominion. And I believe God begins to whisper into our ears, O tired child, O tired saint, let me remind you that I've breathed life into you. And I've given you dominion over the things around you because I have taken that dominion back. And so when God breathes into the secret places of Genesis, he reminds us of his sovereignty and his power and his authority. And that puts me in a place where I have nothing to fear. I fear nothing. Because God has reminded me this morning in my secret quiet place that he is still God. He is the God that pushed the, the stars into their place. He's the God that separated land and water and he's doing the same thing in my life. God is separating me from the things that do not bring me life. God is separating me from bad attitudes and stinking thinking and wrong, evil things that he's putting me. He's dividing the waters in my life that I would have a safe land and a solid land and a solid place to live and stay. But again, I must be reminded of this in the secret place, in the secret place of God. Now, the word of God ends with the book of Revelations, does it not? And the book of Revelations reminds us of how it ends. It reminds us that, first of all, that God ends it. <laughs> it's, it's about his timing, isn't it? It's about when he says, enough is enough. And this glorious trumpet begins to blow. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And all of the rest of the saints that are left over will be gathered up into heaven as well. And so I'm reminded when I get into the secret place that God controls my beginning also all the way to my end. And I have nothing to fear because when he blows the trumpet, he blows it because he's calling me up. God calls my name up because I have found your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So when the trumpet blows, the call is for you. Now the beauty of what God has done, though, when we look at Revelation, is that it is not my job to jump to heaven. When the trumpet blows, he automatically pulls me up and I rise in his glory. And saints, I want to be able to say that that is what God is still doing today. When he blows his trumpet in the secret place, we don't rise in our own strength. He calls us up to his glory. And God has called you up to his glory in something today. God has called you up to his glory in a situation you might be going through or something you may face today. But God reminds you of revelation. And God says, when the trumpet blows, I will rise you up. 
And so I think about the fact that God, he knows my beginning from my end. And so if he knows my beginning from my end, he certainly knows the dash marks in the middle. Amen? He knows that when I, when I was born and when I passed away, let, let the Lord of God, let his thumbprint be on the dash mark in between. And so if he knows all those things, then, then why in the world, Lord God, do I, do I strive to, to do so much in the flesh when I've experienced so much life in the Spirit of God? I don't know about you, but the day that was accomplished more things in my life was the day I bended the knee and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. God accomplished more things in that two-minute prayer, probably, than any other time in my entire life. More power was pulled out, poured out, more things were covered from my past, and my destiny changed in just a two-minute bent knee prayer with God. If there is so much power in the moment of salvation, then why do we strive so much in the flesh? Because the only thing that was asked of my flesh in that moment was that it would die. That it would die, that it would lay itself in sacrifice to God. So, Lord God, why do we change the program? Why do we try to change the instructions? And I'm guilty of it more than anybody else probably in the room. I get so busy doing. But the Lord said, just, I'm, I'm more interested in your being than your doing. So, so we find the secret place. We find that the Lord God, we, we need to, the secret place is where, is where there's a smell of death. There's a, there's a smell of the flesh. There's a smell of the flesh being sacrificed and the Spirit of God coming to alive, coming alive in us. That's what happens in the secret place. The secret place is a place of sacrifice, whether we sacrifice our desires for the Lord's glory. And it happens between Genesis and Revelation. Amen? Let's continue on. Would you join me in Psalm chapter 62? We're going to read verses 1 through 12. We're doing okay this morning. Are we all right? All right, all right. I don't want to be, we're a little quiet. I'm sure we're okay. So I'm good if you're good. So again, this is a psalm from David, and I, I just love this passage. Um, it says this, starting in verse 1 of chapter 62. Truly my soul waiteth from God, upon God. From him cometh my salvation. You have to stop there when you read the word of God like this. You can't just run past that. That's a powerful thing. That's really, really powerful. Again, he says, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes when I'm praying for something, I, I feel like God is saying to me, hush, be still for a moment. Do you, do you hear the footsteps? Do you hear the footsteps? And I, 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 I'm always before God, God, you, you gotta, I got to learn, Lord God, to wait on you more. I've got to learn to wait upon you and not be the source of my own salvation or my own hope. And, and as I begin to wait, the Lord reminds me, if you listen carefully, you will hear the trumpet. You will hear the footsteps of salvation coming to your doorstep. You will hear God coming to your rescue. Because whenever God shows up, he always brings salvation from what's going on. And the world needs to be able to hear the footsteps of God again because the world is hungry for salvation because they're in trouble. They're absolutely in trouble. And I don't know about you, but when I'm in trouble, I need to be able to go to the secret place and to begin to hear the footprints of the Lord or the steps of the Lord because he says to us that my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. There is no other source of salvation but God and God alone. Amen. He is my high place. He's my high priest. He's my refuge. He's my hope. And he is only my salvation. Only he is my salvation. And so, body of Christ, I want to be able to say to you that when we get into the to the quiet place, the secret place with God, you will always find that the soul will be revived of the salvation of God. God's always reminding us of his salvation, his provision inside of our lives. He, there's always a sense, there's always a sense of the power and the authority of the salvation of God. And you know, for those of you that are ministering to somebody around you that's really struggling with something, I, I have found so much that in ministering or counseling, this is a place that I often stop and I go back to because as they're telling me all their problems and all their woes, I constantly stop and say, so have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Oh, I have, Pastor, but this is what the problem is. My mother-in-law is driving me insane. Da -da 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 -da. Or I can't get along with my husband. Da -da 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 -da. Or my kids. Da -da -da. And I always have to stop and, <clears throat> and be able to say, you're, you're full of so much anxiety, and I appreciate that so much, but, but can we come back to something? So you are a saved child of God. And they would say, well, yes, yes, Pastor, I, I'm saved. I'm saved. So why do you ask that, Pastor? 
I believe that God wants us just to simply sit here for a little bit and get into prayer and wait upon the word of salvation to come to us for what you have need of. See, it's, it's so important that we teach the body of Christ how to wait upon the word of salvation that changes the soul that he wants to bring to us. We, we have to learn how to wait and discern in the spirit. God, these are the situations around us, but Lord, what really is the problem? These are the symptoms, but what really is the disease, oh Lord God? What really is the disease? And almost nine times out of ten, it comes back to the fact of the, of the issue that, Lord God, we're struggling with your sovereignty in my life. God, I'm so stressed about all of this stuff, and I'm beginning to realize, God, that it feels like it's out of control. So, Father, Lord God, if you would help me in this, and the Lord says, peace be still, my child. How many times does God say, peace be still, but in the midst of our busyness, we're running past the peace be still to try to strive and find peace in something else. But the Lord is saying, peace be still, that he would remind us. Because see, the word salvation has authority in it. It has power. It has strength in it. It has redemption power to it. So when the Lord God says, wait upon my salvation, what he's really saying to us is, let me remind you of what I've done in your life that you would have peace about where I have you now. Because the enemy would like to rob us of all of our peace. But the voice and the word of salvation, it brings with it peace because it brings with it absolute, solemn, um, absolute authority in it. And so the word salvation, he says to us, let's read on. Verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So he only is my rock. Uh, just, I just, uh, he only is my rock. He only is my firm foundation. He only is who I stand in and stand on when the waters begin to rise around me. He only is the only unmovable thing in my life that I can absolutely trust because he's my rock. And he's such a rock that he will not be moved by circumstances or by trials or by the lies of others about my life. He is so big that he will not be, he will not be moved on my behalf. He is a place of firm foundation that we stand and do not have to worry or fear about those things raging around us. At times in my life when I think about being overwhelmed and flooded by circumstances and situation. I think sometimes about this passage of scripture where it says that he is my rock. He is my rock. And I begin to get the visual that sometimes waves may crash on the sides of the rocks, but it never overtakes the top of the rock. I, I, I never have to fear that he'll allow the waves to become too high, that they will never overtake me. Because see, as I know the word of God, it says that he has authority over the winds and the waves. And he says, peace be still. So in the place that he's positioned me on my rock, it's a place of safety. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to be in fear of it because there is, there's just strength in the rock. The world has built so many things upon sinking sand. And we have to be careful that we don't build our level of faith and belief in Jesus Christ on sinking sand. That we don't build it on what we see or what we feel we need to see, but upon the truth found upon the word of God. I don't build my salvation, God, and my belief and my trust in you based on what I believe I have to see. I believe it, Lord God, based on what you have already done and what you're saying still today. Amen? And church, as we begin to usher through a time of season, a season of change, where God begins to position us to do more ministry, it is so important that we recognize and often check our foundation, that our foundation is firm, it's built upon the rock. We do that within our families. We do that within our communities. We do that within our job. God, am I building my whole life upon the rock of Jesus Christ, or am I trying to build on something that's a little bit quicker, maybe? How many of you know it's easier to dig sand than it is to dig a rock? It's easier to dig out a footer in sand because it's just easier than have to carve out a platform for a footer upon rock. But the easy is never, never the most solid way to go. And so church, in our doing, in our, in our pursuing what God wants us to do in the secret place, I believe he reminds us that sometimes it just takes time for God to carve the foundation for what he's building upon our life, and we can't get too anxious or ahead of that. But just know that he's chiseling. Know that he's building. Know that he's changing. Know that he's got a design. Know that he's got a plan for your life, and that plan will come to pass. 
I'm reminded of that of this secret place. Because I see what he did for Isaiah. I see what he did for John and Mark and Peter and Luke. I see what he did for John the Baptist. I saw his faithfulness in, in, in Isaiah all over the place. And if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for me. He's no respecter of persons. So, church, I want to remind you today, I, I want to say to somebody today, I just feel this in my spirit, that you, you need to sometimes not just stand on the rock, but sometimes you need to sit on the rock. What I'm saying with that is this, is that sometimes you need to, you need to be able to find comfort and peace in, in the midst of God carving out a platform for your life and what he wants to do. He's going to be faithful to finish that. But he may have you in a place where he's just simply chiseling the foundation. But it's okay because when the foundation is done being chiseled, he'll tell you when it's time and he'll start laying blocks. And he'll start building something. But sometimes the foundation is the hardest place to be. Isn't it? When God has to chisel things away that, that, that are not of him, that, that get us off balance, and sometimes we may be to a place, some of you may be to a place where God's been chiseling for a long time and there's just a couple pebbles left over that God is saying, i got to get rid of some of this stuff still. I love you, but we've, we've got to remove this still. Some, some may be at the place of just beginnings where God is, and then you think about how a, a sculptor would sculpt something. When he first starts out, he takes big blows, doesn't he? Boom, knocks off big chunks of things. That's how it happened in my life. God knocked off all kinds of stuff. God knocked off my language. God took, God took junk from me, bad mouth, bad attitudes, all this, just God, just huge blows in my life. But God is still chiseling the finite stuff in me, isn't he? And sometimes that takes more detail and time because he doesn't want to hurt anything. He doesn't want to destroy anything. See, he's made something beautiful here that he's really happy with, but yet he may be working on another part of the body, another part of the face, and so he's delicate to be able to chisel with this. And if we try to rush the, the master maker, all of a sudden, all, things start falling off that shouldn't fall off. All of a sudden, we're like, God, can you finish this a little bit faster? And what we're saying is, God, swing quicker because I don't want to have any more patience for this situation. But God is saying to you and I sometimes, I'm doing the detailed work. Just be patient with me. I'm doing the intricate work so that when people get close to you, they see a greater depth of beauty. You know, Mount Rushmore, I've never been to Mount Rushmore, but I, 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 it's wonderful. I've seen tons of pictures of it. Um, but I have heard, though, that as you get closer to Mount Rushmore and take pictures of Mount Rushmore, the details are not very good. It's just all big swiping. They just went up there and carved noses and eyes and all that kind of stuff. But there's really no finite detail to it. And as I think about, I think about you and I, and I think about the fact that God desires for us to have intimate relationships, and, and, and when God is doing something inside of a church like this, I believe that he's trying to carve us off so that all the beauty marks are in the right place. All the, all the features are just like they're supposed to be. Because, see, we don't look like us anymore. We look like him. And that's sometimes the problem inside the church, is that we have an expectation that demands that it looks a little bit like us. And God says, no, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. It didn't work with Samson, did it? It didn't work with so many people we find in the Word of God. It can't look a little bit like you. It's got to look just like me. And so, so in the hiding places, sometimes God is doing the deep chiseling and removing, removing the finite pieces of us because he wants us to look less like us and so much more like him. And let us be honest, there are times that in our own life, we bring some of the world and we bring chunks in with the, of the world with us and, and we say, God, I want you to work this into your masterpiece. Can you do that, please? And the Lord says lovingly to us, that's not of me. I can't, no, no, I can't, I can't use that. But I will use you. I, will, I, have, I have chosen, I have chosen you. I, I have searched the world over to choose such a stone as you to be able to cover, I mean, to be able to carve out a unique piece of artwork that will be beautiful. But I've got to get down past the surface to the deep places where the veins of the stones run and all the beauty of what I've put inside of you exist. But if you force me to stay on the surface, if you force me to stay on the surface, it will be a blurred image of who I really am. 
And God doesn't do blurred images. <laughs> Glory be to God. He doesn't do blurred images. He brings forth detailed, beautiful pieces of art. And so in our own life, we must recognize that if we, if we strive too much on our own physical ways, what we're trying to do is we're trying to add so much of us to the sculpture of what God is, is doing. And God is declaring to David, I'm trying to clear away the, the rubble. Not add the rubble to the sculpture. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of the heart of our Father today. And I believe that's, I think that's where he wants us to end today, is, is, on, this, is on this place where that God, is, God has brought you into this secret place to be able to do the finite carvings in your life. When I was first saved, I was saved at a Christian camp in um, Mishindo, um, up in Hillsdale, Michigan. I was up there, and I told many of you my story that you know, I was not a kid that was, my parents were in church, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I was not a kid that was welcome in church. Our church did not have a heart really for the for the youth whatsoever. Um, I wasn't a bad kid. I just I just wasn't the kind of kid they really wanted me to have in their church. And so even though my mother and father were deeply involved, my dad was not saved for a long time. But I wasn't. I didn't fit. I just didn't fit. Bottom line. And I remember going to this Christian camp because a lot of my friends were going to go, and there was probably a girl that went. Who knows? But I went anyway. So, but I remember going to this Christian camp. And I, I was this big, tough, I was a big kid. I was strong. I was a good athlete in high school, all kinds of stuff. I was so full of myself, it was ridiculous. I mean, I was just so full of myself. And I really thought that I had it all figured out. And when I think about this text that we're talking about today of God sculpting, I remember, I remember in the midst of that service, a guy named Kent Fisher was preaching the salvation message. It was almost on the last night. It was the... We got, there, we got there Sunday, went home Friday, so it would have been a Thursday, Wednesday evening service, I'm sorry, Wednesday evening service. And he was, he was preaching, he was preaching about the God in you. <laughs> and and I, I just, I thought, what's this about? And, and, and he talked about how that we build false gods because, because we, we, we worship some things in our life. Maybe we worship our physical athletics, or we worship how intelligent we are, we worship how good we look, or we worship our parents, we worship our grandparents' religion, whatever it might be, but he, he was talking about the little gods in our life and, and how that God wants to have us throw those things out so that we can make room for the one true God. And I, I remember listening to this guy preach, and I thought, oh, this is interesting, and, 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 and I thought, I don't want anything to do with this, and, you know, I was doing something in my Bible, and all of a sudden, man, God started just getting a hold of me. And he started talking about how that, Ben, you built some idols in your life out of fear, that you continue to worship to them for hope. And God is saying, you'll never, is it working? I feel like God was asking me a question, is it working? How's it working for you, Ben? And I begin to realize, wow, Lord, don't, this is, this is intimate. Don't, God, what are you doing? This, don't meddle like this. Because see, I had what I thought was reputation with my friends and, and those that knew me back at home. And I thought, you know, we're not doing this. I'm not, and all of a sudden, God started reading my mail in a sense and revealing some deep, deep things in me and, and, and as he began to do the altar call, he asked those to come forward. And I'm like, let's just do this here, God. I believe you're speaking, but we'll just settle this here, okay? Is it okay? Can we just stay here, God? And the evangelist kept speaking about the issue to, of, the need, of the need to recognize God before men, which is what clears the storehouse of all the false gods in your life. And I thought, oh, there's no other way to do this, is there? Then I have to go down front, don't I? And so I'm looking at all the people that I'm with. I think I was dating some girl at the time, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I'll do it, but I'll take the side aisle and go down to the very end over here where hardly anybody's at in the corner. God, that'll be all right, won't it? And sure enough, I went down there and went to the side, and altar was lying with other kids, and they were being prayed for. And I'm like, okay, God, we can do this. And so he was leading everybody through a corporate prayer of salvation. So I'm doing the corporate prayer of salvation. Father, I repent for my sins, and I thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sins. I believe is the Son of God. Please come into my life and become Lord of my life. And I felt changed. I felt different. I thought, wow, hey, man, that feels good. And I thought, oh, this is good. And I look around, and I can probably sneak back to my seat. And so I begin to do that. And out of the corner of my eye, this big, huge guy comes down, one of the camp counselors, and said, Ben, I've been expecting you. And I thought, oh, okay, here we go. And, and he goes, I've been expecting you all week to come down. I'm so glad you made your choice to come down for salvation. And... Uh, 
and his name was Doug. And I'm like, uh, Doug, I, I, yeah, that's great, man. I'm just, I, I really believe God's, and he said, wait a minute. <laughs> so I was trying to put this situation in a box so I could comfortably get back to my seat as soon as possible. And, and Doug began to, he said, can I just pray with you? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that sounds great, Doug. I said, I already prayed the prayer of salvation. He goes, oh, I, I knew you had. I just want to pray with you for a little bit. And all of a sudden, it was almost like Doug stepped out of the room and God stepped into the sanctuary and began to pray over my salvation. And God got intimate. God got personal. God got busy with me. And God started praying and praying over me about things in my life. And what was happening in my life was this. God was taking this big, huge chisel, and he was cutting away pride. He was cutting away anger. He was cutting away disappointments. And, man, you could just feel just these chunks fall off of my life. I could almost feel the hammer and hear the chisel went, ba-dung, ba-dung, and just stuff started falling off of my life. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, Lord God, why are you doing this in front of everybody? What is the deal with this? God, why would you do this out in the open like that? But yet I felt safe. But yet I was also afraid because, see, I was still surrendering my own life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I had prayed the prayer of salvation, but what happened happened then was starting to happen now in the natural and the physical. And God began to take off chunks of my life, chunks of my life, and exposed it, in a sense, to the 150 kids who were at camp with me. And I was sobbing, and I was crying, and and I was asking, Lord, wow, this is wonderful, and Eventually, it started to leave me this fear, but everybody thought. But as we were done, I get back up and I begin to, to go back to my seat. I, I begin to pass people I'd met all week and, and they were high fiving me and all oh, praise the God. Look what He's done in your life. Praise God. And I get back to my seat and I'm like, wow, Lord, what is this? What have you done? Wow. How do I feel so free but so heavy at the same time? This has to be a God thing. Because, see, my heart was so heavy with love for the first time and with truth and with hope, but yet the burden of inferiority and fear and worry and sin and hell was just chiseled off of my life. So I get back to my seat and I begin to sit there and friends are coming up and they're congratulating me and and people are saying, you know, it was so funny, you don't know how long people have been praying for you until that moment, but people are like, man, I've been praying for you for so long, Ben, praise God. I'm like, well, I must have been a mess. But, you know, they kept encouraging me. Well, it's just so great to have you, you know, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And da, 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 da. And then the week was wonderful. And I, I didn't feel, but one of the most profound things said to me at the end of that week was when Doug and I were leaving, Doug came and found me as I was jumping back in my car to go home. And he goes, you know, it's interesting what God did in your life this past week. He goes, I really, God took off some major chunks, didn't he? And I said, man, he did. He did, man. And he goes, well, do me a favor. When you leave, make sure that you didn't pack those in your bag when you leave. I thought, wow. And he goes, do me a favor. When you go home, back to your church, don't let any of them try to reattach that stuff to you. Because religion will. Religion will try to reattach failure. Religion will try to reattach. They'll take away grace and try to reattach performance. And so God just reminded me, don't let anything of those things reattach themselves to you. And faith assembly, that's the word of God for us today. I found my hiding place between Genesis and Revelation where I found Jesus and I found salvation. And so therefore in my going, I recognize that it is not I that goes, but it is God that goes through me. And I need to be in a constant place of rest upon the chiseler's platform because he's still chiseling away in my own life. The finer details so that as we draw closer and closer in relationships, you see less of me, but you see a lot more of him. And eventually, when the trumpet blows, you'll see all of him.